I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak about a course that's entering its 10th year at the University of Virginia. Quantitative Biological Reasoning, or QBR for short, is not a class in systems biology. However, it teaches a way of thinking about science that seems to resonate disproportionately with students inclined towards systems biology. What is quantitative biological reasoning and why might systems biology fall within it? I was originally going to say that it is hard to define, you know it when you see it, but then I realized that that would be a total cop-out. Instead, I pushed myself and arrived at three characteristics of good quantitative biological reasoning. First is fluid inquiry. No boundaries for the science that is pursued. No cookbooks for the way that the research is executed. Good QBR is fearless. The second is technical excellence and mastery of execution. The right approaches at the right time and definitive results every time. Good QBR is flawless or at least aspires to be so. And the third is expectation, disappointment, serendipity, communicated. And this implies that whether one is at a po uh, reading a paper or on a podium, the work is honest about the trials and tribulations along the way, all of the things that make science great and tragic, communicated to the audience as clearly as possible. Good QBR is forthright. And taken together, I would argue that the very best systems biology papers, research, etc., exemplifies quantitative biological reasoning. And when I started at UVA, the inspiration for QBR came from me not wanting to inherit a core class, uh, as well as from a classic offering in the MIT Department of Biology called Methods and Logic. Methods and Logic uh, seeks to introduce students, provide them with the tools to be able to make fundamental advances in the basic sciences, and give uh, insight into the way in which those tools are deployed appropriately. I pitched a variant of this idea to uh, my, the chair of UVA at the time, Tom Scalak, under the unimaginative title, Methods and Logic in BME. Tom, being a supportive chair, only shot down the title and said, why don't you call it quantitative biological reasoning instead? At which point I thought, I'll call it whatever you like as long as you let me teach it. And uh, it was around this time I was invited to come to, to UVA, part of a Whitaker Foundation site visit, and I um, framed this course uh, to the Whitaker Foundation as a way to bring rigorous critical thinking from biology to engineers. And the president of the Whitaker Foundation, Peter Katona, uh, found it so odd that not only did he want to use that line, but he wanted to check with my thesis advisor, Doug Laufenberger, to see if these crazy ideas came from him. Doug, being a supportive advisor let me hang on my own, and so from that point forward, I guess I was committed to teaching quantitative biological reasoning at UVA. What are the learning objectives for QBR? For the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, expand upon uh, the, the learning just that I'm just going to list them. Uh, I hope that their utility and importance is self-evident to this audience. First is to appreciate biological thinking that is qualitative, question-based, discovery-oriented from an engineering perspective that is quantitative, problem-based, and goal-oriented. Second, students will learn to figure out how to gain deep familiarity with experimental procedures and computational procedures without actually doing them. And this is done in a self-directed manner. Students will find the way that works for them to de develop that skill set. Third is to embrace paper reading as a problem-solving exercise rather than as a fact-gathering exercise. And last is to gain extensive practice with open and informal scientific communication, and I'll speak more about how we accomplish that. How do we accomplish these objectives broadly? For the most part, uh, we do this by reading sharply written papers wherever I can find them. Here's an example uh, of a paper from over 55 years ago related to the linear incorporation of immediate amino acids during protein synthesis. Here's another example. This is a paper that's never been taught in QPR before, but will be for the first time next spring, a paper from Lucas Pelkman's group that just came out a couple of months ago. We also read more than the primary literature. Good science can change the way that you think, but so can good commentaries, opinions, and perspectives. 
Uh, here is our oldest paper in the class from T.C. Chamberlain, uh, putting forth an idea of working with multiple hypotheses concurrently as an efficient means to make scientific advances. And here's a perspective um, from just within the last year on an idea of triangulation using multiple complementary approaches to point towards the same conclusion rather than simply repeating the same approach over and over and over again. It's really hard to become a QBR paper and stay there year after year. In the class, I teach students how to dissect papers the way food critic might dissect a seven course meal. And just like a great restaurant, rich and sharply reasoned papers can be revisited again and again. You can find new pieces of information, new insights um, by revisiting. This paper has kicked off QBR from the very beginning and, uh, and um, is from John Curian's group uh, and, and involves the allosteric mechanism auto-activation of the EGF receptor tyrosine kinase. And in the 10 years I've taught this class, we have never in the first one and a half hour course been able to make it past figure two in this paper. So it sets the stage for the deep reading that we do and all of the literature that's provided in the class. To rally the students around deep reading, you need to incentivize and formalize engagement. Class participation is a major component of the grade. Every day, students are evaluated whether they met, did not meet, or exceeded my expectations. And these are not a one-size-fits-all uh, one set of expectations, but rather my personal expectations for that student, which evolves as the course moves along and as that student progresses. Here's an example of one of my old tables that I do by hand. And here's an example of a highly successful outcome from the, the most recent offering. Um, Raquel had a hard time getting up to speed in the beginning portion of the class, but she really showed tremendous growth over uh, the course of the semester. And uh, she's now in the Systems and Computational Biomedicine program at NYU, and I hope impressing people with her intellect as we speak. We don't just read papers. Uh, for the midterm, the class gets experience with the dreaded chalk talk format in teams of three. The teams reach into a hat, pull out a topic, and then they have one month to prepare for a chalk talk of 20 minutes, armed with their notes and three dry erase markers, and then followed up with 20 minutes of questioning from the class who is seeking to improve their class participation scores when they're not presenting. This creates a very dynamic format of the class interacting with one another, peer-to-peer -peer critique, inquiry, and answering. It's, a, it's a, one of my most favorite parts of the class. QBR also emphasizes written communication. I give standalone lectures on technical writing and information design then I challenge the class to apply those principles in a way I picked up from my other thesis advisor, Mike Yaffe. Uh, in addition to running a signaling biochemistry lab and serving in the Army, uh, Mike is a trauma surgeon. When he was doing his surgical residency, he stepped away from science for a long time and got to miss it. To keep himself engaged, he would cut figures out of papers and see if he could piece together the story from what was shown. I do the same thing in QBR by redaction. Each team is given nature, science, caliber results, data, and then the team is tasked with figuring out what an effective story is and then presenting that in a, a manuscript form. And that's the class. Uh, how have we done? I think that the numerical ev uh, evaluations of the class are always skewed and tend to be meaningless without context. So uh, instead what I did was made, uh, make my first word cloud using the free answer evaluations for the past five years of QBR. And I was pretty happy with the way that it turned out. Student read paper, student figure out paper, student write paper, learn more, discuss more, think more. And here I am down to the bottom, giving the class the foundation to achieve those goals. And if the immediate, studio, uh, immediate student evaluations are non-scientific, then long-term evaluations are even less so. But uh, what I wanted to do is leave you with an anecdote from an early QBR student who is now faculty at the University of Illinois. 
I won't read the, the, the note, um, but I'll simply close by thanking Paul and the other QBR alumni who have helped me shape this course over a number of years, and you all for listening.